you just can't roll up on me while I'm praying. <laughs> Messed up my whole prayer life right there. Yeah, I mean, y'all praying for Jabari that God would give him a speedy recovery. Yeah. Amen. We're praying for him. And then after God healed him, we need him to stay off the basketball court. He can only play TV games moving forward. But we're glad to be here. Listen, we have someone special here tonight. And I'll come up back up after Jabari take us in worship. But something special is going to happen tonight. How many of y'all are just open for God to speak to you? All right. So let's, let's just go up in worship. Broken and everything.
Everybody say Sunday. If you're between the ages of 18 and 35, I am going to be back in this building for our JG group, our Joshua Gathering group. It's going to be from 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. Everybody between 18 and 35, raise your hand. You should do the QR code so that you can register to be a part of that. It's going to be a panel of people. I will be a part of that panel in this building. I think it's in our multi-purpose room, all right? Um, MIT is Ministers in Training. If you believe that God's called you to ministry, we want you to be trained properly. You can sign up for information of that coming up on the 22nd. Don't forget, Sunday, we are going to celebrate our own Pastor Glenn, his birthday. Amen. He believes in words of encouragement. We ask you to stop, get a car, put a little something, something in there. Amen. Because he's going to open the car like I opened it. Got to pop that card. All right. Empowerment Exchange, if you own a business, we literally have a support group for you. where We bring different business owners together so that you, iron sharpens iron. That's going to be coming up on the 27th, right across the street in our children's building. I am excited about 12-hour prayer coming up. We will literally be in this building from 12 noon to 12 midnight. Those of y'all that are our online members, we want to push you to really come to be a part of that. We're calling it pressing for 12. And we're not telling you that you have to stay in the building all 12, but you need to at least get in this building. Sure, it will be online, but for some of y'all, it's going to be worth the sacrifice. We have it online, but we have a discount rate at the different hotels in this city. Please be a part of that, all right? All right, um, so tomorrow on Friday, Pastor Hill um, will have a, um, a viewing at the Tabernacle around the corner on 78th and Dobson from 5 until 8. And then the funeral will be on Saturday in this building. 
How many of y'all know he was a pillar in this church? He was a pillar in um, New Life. I'm asking you, we all have to be here for this homegoing celebration. Do you not know that his funeral is actually on his birthday? I know as I call it your last party on earth. It's going to be amazing. So we're going to be here what? I think the wait is from 9 to 10, and the funeral starts exactly at 10 o'clock. So be praying for the family, but we're going to just celebrate his life right here in this building. Um, we need to come and move this um, handicap setting. That we, right. We're going to move it where we took, put the video up. Oh, okay, my bad. Amen. We're just glad that the Bible won't let nothing stop him from praising God. Amen. Some of y'all stay at home for the headache, but he's determined to still come in and give God glory. So tonight, I want to introduce you to it. Um, a young man that I met, I really just, I was on social media, and he began to drop some nuggets. And I was like, who is this? And I thought to myself, I have to meet this man. And to God be the glory, I thought it, then I said it. And now what I said has become my reality. Um, he stayed in earlier, and he um, spoke to our staff but I wanted him to come back on Thursday to speak to you. I need you to hear me. He is a voice that you need to pay attention to. Um, nothing is by chance or by accident. When it comes to believers, our steps are ordered by the Lord. And I believe that everyone in the building and those of you that are online, hear me loud and clear. There's something that God wants to speak to you, that he will speak to you at the top of the second quarter of the year to get you ready for the rest of the year. Come on here. There you go. So uh, we're going to do a video introduction and then we'll move on from there. You'll be in the hands of our guests for tonight. As soon as possible in your life, try and make this commitment, this decision, however it occurs to you, to be I felt like I was empowered in a rich, profound way. Everything you need in life, somebody's got. And if you don't know those people, then they will keep a hold of it. And it will be a struggle to access it. Because sometimes what you need is just a phone number. First things I noticed about leaders that are blockbuster, stuck, out of touch, but they're still in charge, unfortunately, is their loss of curiosity. Stop looking for leaders and start looking for servants because your leadership are amongst your servants. seated. There's nothing worse than a partial, partial standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you for your love and your welcome. It's a joy to be with you guys. And uh, Pastor Hannah has become a new friend of mine. And I love that because it gets harder to make new friends the older you get. Some of you are finding that out. Um, so he has become that to me. I love his energy. I love his openness, his curiosity, his mischievous streak, <laughs> his playfulness. Especially when you've been in ministry as long as he has, often with longevity in ministry, playfulness is the first casualty. So to stay happy and playful and light means that he's doing something right and means that he has many years left in him yet to... Get out what's in him. So thank you for welcoming me and receiving me and all of you. Had a wonderful time with some of the staff and the team here today. You know, you guys are very blessed to have the staff and the team here in the church that you do. I know 
I know they're very blessed to have you too. Um, but it's a joy to have spent some time with those guys and now get some time with uh, members of the church here. And what a beautiful building you guys have built. What a, well done. It's a credit to you and to God. It's just fabulous. Listen, I want to read to you from uh, Luke 7, verse 1 to 10. This is a story that is well preached, well worn, um, well understood, I think, or we think we do. There's something going on in this story about a centurion's sick servant that I think we've missed for a long time that I want to try and draw attention to tonight. So let's just read to re-familiarize ourselves with a very familiar passage of Scripture. Let's not hold that against it tonight and think we know what's going on here. Because I thought I did until recent years when I saw something here that I hadn't seen before. Jesus sent to Capernaum, and there a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard about Jesus, so sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loved our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was on his way to the house when the centurion sent friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to this one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Everybody say amazed. He was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. The men who had been sent returned to the house to find the servant well. I needed to frame this passage a different way. And so I've invented a term, because I can and you can, to try to capture what I think is going on here. And the title of this message for you tonight, if you like titles, and I do, is The Centurion Factor. I think this centurion deserves some attention because... I don't think it's easy to amaze God. When you're omnipotent and omniscient, you must be hard to impress. This centurion, this outsider, this Gentile, amazed Jesus. There are very few occasions in the Bible when human beings had this effect on Jesus. This guy was an outsider. He was a Gentile. Worse than that, I suppose, he was a Roman. Worse than that, he was Roman military. But this story in your Bible is subheaded, the centurion servant. You know, subheadings in your Bible are inspired of the Holy Spirit. They're what the Bible translators thought it's best to call this passage. But this is not really about the servant at all because we know nothing about the servant. We don't know what the illness was, how long the illness had taken place, whether this servant was male or female, what the relationship this servant was to the centurion. We don't know. We know that and more about other people Jesus healed. And then the miracle that took place, as you saw at the end, is kind of an incidental thing at the end. The miracle is an incidental mention at the end. When, the, when these guys got home, they found the servant was well. That's it. So this passage isn't really about the servant. It's about the centurion. And... Jesus gets the message from these elders of the Jews because the centurion didn't know Jesus, but he knew someone that did. So he spoke to the elders because as a centurion, he would have clearly been a man of authority and connection and influence and network, and obviously he was wealthy. I know that because when the, Jews, the Jewish leaders spoke to Jesus, they said to him, this man deserves some attention from you because he wrote a check for our synagogue. 
That's kind of what they just said. He paid for our church building. How cool would that be to have someone like this write a check for your church building? The reason centurions, as it were, Gentiles, outsiders, aren't writing checks for church buildings often is because they are not in our circle of love. They are not included in our circle of acceptance. And this guy suspected that would be true of Jesus' attitude to him, didn't know, but he knew these elders. So he asked them on his behalf to ask Jesus if he would come and heal his servant. So they tell Jesus, Jesus sets off to the centurion's house. We don't know how long the walk was, the journey was. You couldn't get an Uber. This is all on foot. And Jesus sets off walking to this centurion's house with his usual entourage, which was his disciples and the crowd. And then some of those Pharisee types, you know, those fake news people, were also following him, watching everything he did to see if they could pick something up and post it, publish it with their angle on it. These, these people have been around for a long time. On Jesus' way to the man's house, for some reason the centurion has second thoughts about what he's set in motion. And he sends a second delegation of staff from his house to intercept Jesus and say, listen, our master has sent us to say to you, he's changed his mind on his original idea. He has another idea, which is, don't bother coming to the house. Just send your word, and that will be enough to get the result that we all want. And the reason he's telling us to tell you that is he wants you to know that he is a man under authority like you, and he knows how authority works. The centurion's saying to Jesus, like me, you know that proximity is not required for authority and power to take place. The centurion spent his life getting edicts, policy updates, law changes, military stuff sent to him from sort of headquarters from Rome and it would have a seal on it. And the seal is as good as the presence of the person that sent the letter. If you refused to do what was in the document or did something different to that or thought I'll ignore it, you could certainly lose your job or your liberty or your life. As a centurion, he understood all the time I get instructions and orders and commands from people that I've never met who are not present. But the letter and the seal and the words are as good as if they were here in the room themselves. He understood that power does not require presence and proximity. He understood that. And so he's, he's trying to say to Jesus, I'm asking you to not come but send your word because I live in a world where people don't come but send their word to me. And he said also, in case that's not enough of an idea, I have staff and servants, and when I tell a staff member to do something, they do it. I tell them, go here and go there, and they do it. And so what he's saying is, Jesus, I know that your words are like servants. So are all of yours. And so he said, so he said why, not, why not send a servant? Why not send a word? Your words are servants. All of our words are servants or masters. Send your word, and it'll be just fine. Now, Jesus stops in his tracks and then turns to everyone and says, I am amazed. I have never seen this kind of faith, even amongst you guys that spend 24-7 with me. <laughs> no believers want to hear that. That the heathens and the Gentiles get it more than you do. These are the guys that are, you know, around the campfire at night, being able to do Q&A but they still didn't get it. And Jesus said, this is amazing. This guy gets it. 
This is fascinating to me. And you know, don't think that those disciples weren't above having a bad attitude towards the centurion. They probably said to themselves, these Romans, who do they think they are? You know, don't come to my house, just send your word. Who does this guy think he is? Doesn't he know this is Jesus? This is what we do. This is our thing. Jesus will come to the house, lay hands on this sick person, and that's when the good stuff happens. Because that's all they'd ever known to date. This is the first time in Jesus' ministry that this had ever happened. This is the first time Jesus healed someone without being in the same room as them. That's why something amazing is going on here. And the idea to not go personally, but to send a word, which was as good as going personally, didn't come from the team, came from the centurion. Now, this is interesting to me because the only person who knew this was possible, the only person who knew it's possible to send a word and not go yourself was Jesus. And he didn't say anything. Jesus knew he could do this, but he didn't volunteer that idea. He didn't say to the elders that came to him, tell him I don't need to come, I'll send a word. He didn't do that. He knew he could do that, but he didn't do that. Instead of saying, I don't need to come, I can send a word, he sets off walking to this man's house to lay hands on the servant, which would have still have been a good outcome. That's good. Would have still had a healing and a miracle. That's good. But on this day, on this particular day, something random and rare and amazing happened when a human being intercepted Jesus with an idea that no one knew was possible because no one had seen it done except Jesus who did not say anything about that possibility. He didn't suggest it. You would think, wouldn't you, that if you knew you only had a few years to get out what was in you, you wouldn't want to waste your life walking down roads you didn't need to. If you can send your word, then why are we going down another road? Why are we in the heat of the day? Why are we all going to someone else's house? If you don't need to go to people's houses, let's just stay where we are and send out words everywhere. But Jesus sets off to this man's house until the man sent an upgraded idea. That's the centurion factor. This upgraded idea of how things could be done. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus didn't give a lecture to his servants that came. Tell the centurion, this is my thing. I know what I'm doing. Don't interfere. I'm going to come to your house. He didn't do any of that. It wasn't patronizing or superior. Jesus literally looked at these guys and his team and said, cool, let's do that instead. Let's do that instead. Let's not go to the house. I'll just send my word. This isn't my idea. It's his idea. Let's just go with his. My idea was I'll go to the house because that's what he asked me to do. Then he had another idea that says, don't come to the house, send your word. And Jesus was like, cool, let's do that instead. How many... Don't clap, I ain't got time. How many roads, question, this has bothered me for years. How many roads does God unnecessarily walk down? Because we are so obsessed with a business as usual outcome and a business as usual approach that no one has a new idea. And this guy, see, centurion fact of faith is human interruption of divine intention. Because the divine intention is to go to the man's house. And then a guy interrupts Jesus, intercepts Jesus, and Jesus said, okay, we're going to change everything. Let's do it their way. Has it occurred to you that there's a lot more to God than you've ever realized, even though you've realized a lot and seen a lot, that God is capable of doing things and doing things in certain ways and using people 
All kinds of people you don't approve of, God is using. And that's a surprise, and that's pretty amazing and awful and shocking. <laughs> so, you can think you know someone so well, and then they do something, you're like, what? I had a friend called Bill. I'd known Bill for 15 years. Bill and I were working on the university campus in our city, reaching the students. We sat in a coffee shop, and we were chatting to students, and I'd been, you know, Bill and I had been friends and worked together in ministry for 15 years. And these Chinese students came in. And them obviously had come to do a course at the university in our city. And about a dozen of these Chinese kids came in and sat down. As we got up to leave the coffee shop, Bill, my friend, walked over to these Chinese kids and started speaking to them in fluent Chinese. Mandarin. And I'm like, I don't, mean, I don't mean an odd word. I mean fluent. Shock. My sh shock was an understatement. For me, I'm like, what? I, I was mad shocked. You know, have you ever been angry shocked? You're shocked, but there's an anger because you think, how can I not know this? I waited outside for Bill. When Bill came out, I'm like, Bill, What? Bill, what, what just happened? You speak freaking Chinese. What? Bill, how can I have known you for 15 years and you never told me that you speak Chinese? Bill, in his cool calm, because Bill was cool, calm, borderline boring. That was Bill. What I loved about Bill. Bill, in his cool, calm, non-excitable, doesn't really care way, I said to him, why didn't you tell me? And Bill looked at me and said, because you never asked. And I'm thinking, why would I have asked? There was no clue. In case you're thinking, there must have been a clue that you missed. No, 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 no. We live in a part of England called Yorkshire. It's like the Shire on the Lord of the Rings is where we live. It's green hills and rolling hills and villages. And we live in the Shire. So think Shire, think Hobbit. That's Bill. Does any of that sound Chinese to you? So don't be thinking, you missed it, Paul. No, I didn't. God is like Bill. God can speak Chinese, but he won't tell you. And he won't tell you because you didn't ask. Jesus knew, I don't need to go to this man's house. But he didn't say, I can do this another way. He was going to go to the man's house. He was going to walk down another road. He didn't need to. Because God does not operate in your life according to his ability. He operates according to your faith. And listen, if your, faith makes, if your faith makes him walk down a road to your house, he'll do that. But if your faith says, I've got a different idea, what about doing it this way, God? God will say, cool, let's do it that way then. If we are friends of God, what kind of friendship is it when only God has ideas and you have no suggestions? If we're in a friendship with God, I wouldn't want to be in a friendship where only my friend could make suggestions, have ideas, decide where we eat, what we do, where we vacation, what our interests are. If I had a friend and it was only like that, we wouldn't be friends long. We, have, we say we're friends of God. I would not be friends with a God that has no interest in how I think something could actually be done differently or better. Even if I have the audacity to say, you know what, God, if I were you, why don't we try it this way? You know what you're going to find God will do sometimes? God will say, cool, let's do that then. Listen to me. This church could not have come to where you've come to without centurion factor faith. It's all over your ministry. But listen to me. You are, and none of us are far from defaulting back to comfort. 
if centurion fact of faith brought you to where you are, what happens is eventually we settle, get comfortable, and it becomes rarer and rarer, and God is walking down roads he doesn't need to with us because we like it that way. We like the comfort and the safety and the predictability of him coming to our house, as it were, and it's been a long time since there's been new ideas that brought you to where you are. And it's not sufficient that centurion fact of faith is in people up here. This is in all of you. This is not the exclusive domain of people in full-time ministry. This is in all of your lives and hearts, within all of your capabilities to amaze God. And it can start small. It doesn't need to be grand things. It can be small things that you secretly experiment with, that you told no one, where you got God momentarily to show up for you in an unusual way. It can be small things where you got God to speak Chinese. Don't tell anyone, don't announce it, but you thought, ooh, that's interesting. I didn't think God would back me up there. I didn't think God would use me. I don't tell anyone, don't announce it, but you're thinking, ooh, this is not the God that I have been told about. This is a different Jesus to the one I've been told about. And you are stepping in the territory of the centurion fact of faith. How unhelpful is God? <laughs> how unhelpful, how rude is God? To know that there's a better way to do something and not tell you feels to me like bad parenting. Huh. If you watched your kids struggling and knew there was a better way and didn't say anything, I think that would be bad parenting. So for God to know there's a better way and not say anything gives me a problem with God. If I was omniscient and omnipotent, I wouldn't watch you struggle. I'm going to tell you, God will. God would rather walk down roads he doesn't need to. Listen to this carefully. He would rather do things in the same old way if that's the way that you want him to be in your life. God will not force you into a new idea when it's not your idea. Because you'll always resent being pushed there. This was never my idea. I didn't really want this. So God's not going to make you adopt a different approach and have a different idea. If it doesn't come from you and God did it, you've always got to cop out on an off-ramp. So God will keep doing the same thing, and he has, by the way, generationally through history, not much has changed. There are spikes throughout church history. There are spikes on the graph, if you like, of something amazing happened in history. I'm going to tell you because I've researched this. Where there's ever been a spike of something God's doing in the earth in history, this kind of faith has been at the root of it. A human being, a group of human beings have found centurion fact of faith and they intercepted God's approach to humanity and they changed things from business as usual to a completely different outcome in their generation. Whether it's continued or not is a different matter. And I think God wants us in our generation here now, at this time and season of history, to dare to believe again that this could become a more normal mainstream response to God from His church than the business as usual stuff, which still has a good outcome. It doesn't make you a bad person or a weak person. It's still a good outcome. But I tried to build a church. I pastored for over 30 years in the same church in England. I tried to build a church and a team around me that was crazy. Crazy. You know, saying, saying is overrated when you need a breakthrough. Don't, don't be bringing those same people to talk to me. When you desperately need a breakthrough, you better find someone crazy to talk to. Remember when that, that paralyzed guy was on a stretcher 
and four of his friends were carrying him to the miracle meeting or to where Jesus was, whatever you call it. And these guys got there late because people, people that are carrying weight move slower. That's why some of you don't carry much weight. Because, because you know, if I take on that burden, it's going to slow me down. Yeah, it will. It's a, a sign of immaturity to not carry weight. I, I, have, I have eight grandchildren. And I watch my grandchildren when they come out of school. First thing they do is give all their belongings to their mum. Every mum in here said, amen is the right thing to say there. Give all their belongings, their bags, their coat, their books to mum while they skip around and play with their friends. Kids don't want to carry weight. I would have a riot in my house when my kids were young. My kids are all grown up now, married. I would have a riot in my house over whose cup is that? And I would say to my kids, hey, take that cup with you, will you, on your way to the kitchen. It's not mine. They'd rather argue over whose cup it is than move it. And we've built churches like that. We've built organizations, businesses, and political parties like that. It's not my cup. I didn't use that cup. So here's these four guys carrying this paralyzed guy. They get late. When they get there, the house is full. They can't get towards Jesus. You know, it would not have been a bad outcome if they'd have said to each other, to the guy on the stretcher, we're sorry. We tried our best. We couldn't get here on time. We're so sorry. Listen, it's hot. You're dehydrated. We need to get you home. We'll try this another day. We'll try and find where Jesus is next. We'll attempt it next week. That would not have been a bad thing to have said. They tried. And maybe that was talked about. But somewhere, someone amongst those people, someone had a crazy idea. Someone said, I've got an idea. Oh, what's that? Let's vandalize the property. Because that's what they did. Let's dig a hole in the roof. You know, to put a man through a roof on a stretcher, you're not talking a small hole. Let's destroy the roof and lower this man down in front of Jesus. And that's what they did. So imagine me speaking here and the roof starts caving in and a stretcher comes down in front of my eyes. That's exactly what happened. The place is packed. The stretcher comes down. Jesus looks up, sees this happening. Jesus would have thought to himself, this is fun. This is different. Someone here is crazy. I like this. This guy gets down in front of him. Clearly needs a miracle. Here's what Jesus did not say. There's a line, you know. You were here late. Others were here before you. You have to wait your turn. Nor did Jesus say, I can't lay hands on you and pray for you because if I do, I'll be seen to be endorsing criminal behavior. No, I think Jesus must have thought, wow, this is hilarious. And I think Jesus went, boom, high five, go home. Tearing a hole in the roof was not Jesus' idea. It was a crazy person's idea. And God celebrated and embraced and met them in their craziness. When the sun stood still for Joshua, I want you to know this was not God's idea. It was the craziness of Joshua who had a problem of it's getting dark our enemies are going to get away. We have not defeated them yet fully. If I had a few more hours light, this would be a done deal and they'd never live to fight another day. That's his dilemma, a, a regular military dilemma. If it had finished that day and the enemy, the enemy had escaped, they lived to fight another day. That's okay. We did our best. But instead, Joshua had this weird idea and he shouted up to God, and shouted up to the sun, 
and commanded it to stand still. I think if I was in, in Joshua's team, I'd have think, whoa. Whoa, what did he, I'm glad no one else heard him. We love him, trust him, we'll stand by him. But whoa, that was crazy. But he, he didn't stop. He shouted, son, stand still. And you know what God did? God went, okay, I can do that. What if you can do that, God? Why didn't you do it? Because you never. I, I think that's all going on here. And the Bible says, never has there been a day before or since when God made the sun stand still for a man. When a man commanded the sun to stand still, never been a day before or since like that, unprecedented. Now, not to be scientific here or anything, um, but <laughs> you all know, don't you, the sun doesn't move. So sun stand still, technically, is not an accurate prayer. But God didn't say, hang on a minute, Joshua, please. Do you know how planets work and so on? Actually, what Joshua is asking for is something more complicated. He's asking for the rotation of the earth around the sun to be interrupted. What? God didn't say to Joshua, okay, so let me get it straight. You want me to interrupt the cosmos? to kill a few more bad guys? Just to kill a few more bad guys? You're asking me to interrupt with planetary alignments to kill a few more bad guys? Get real. That's completely excessive. God didn't do that. God said, cool, I can do that. Boom, sun stands still, done. This was not God's idea. But God did it anyway. God stepped in anyway. You don't know, don't you, this may seem an obvious thing to say to you, but I think it's worth asking yourself. You do know, don't you, that people in the Bible did not know they were in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, to point out the obvious, but these people weren't playing a part to provide us all with sermons later on. These guys aren't got a script from God saying, now what you do is this, the centurion, you come stage right and say this, and then later on, these preachers will have a lot to talk about because I'm setting it all up. These people in the Bible didn't know they're in the Bible. They're just, they're just like you. They're in real time, on any given day, going through something, suffering, got a problem, and a certain behavior comes out of them. And God's like, cool, I can respond to that. I can work with that. And I'm calling all of this stuff centurion factor faith. God speaks Chinese. God is able to do things that you don't know he can do, don't think he would do, don't approve of him doing, don't agree with him doing. You know, history, church history is a story of every move of God persecuting the one that comes after it. Or people saying, oh, that's not God, that's not God, because God didn't do it here, for us, that can't be God. <laughs> I used to get asked all the time, are you going to the move of God? And it was like going to you know, Pensacola or Toronto in my lifetime or um, Florida move of God or whatever they were that were called that in the world and going way back, it would be Indonesian revival or not. It depends how old you are in your generation as to what was called the move of God that you were asked, are you going to, have you been to? And as a local church pastor, I got fed up. Or well, people saying to me, have you been, are you going to the move of God? And I said, no, I'm not. Nothing against it, feel free to go. But I have a question for you all. How come the move of God is never where I am? <laughs> Has God got a geographical problem here? I mean, and I say to my church, question, do you think this is a move of God? And they thought it was a trick question. Ooh, hmm, I'm not sure. Hmm, because the move of God usually is more spectacular than this. 
You know, people aren't coming out of wheelchairs and glowing in the dark when the anointing's on them. And there's no angels river dancing on the duvets. <laughs> the local church is the greatest generational move of God that the world has ever seen. Others will come and go. You, this church, is a move of God. And we forget that because there's so much ordinariness in building a local church. There's so much normality, so much routine, so many things need to be done and attended to, nothing exciting to see here. And so we think that when that crops up somewhere else and we hear of miracles and so on and so on, we call that the move of God and run to it while God's doing something spectacular in your life in longevity that isn't an event, it's a process, and we all hate process and love events. And so people would leave our church to go to a move of God, they'd disappear for weeks, then they'd come back asking for time with me, who never spoke to me. As you know, so-and-so's come back from being, you know, at the move of God, he would like to see you, my team would say, and I said, oh, okay, here we go. So I would amuse them because I have a naughty side. I'd say, okay, I'll tell him to come and see me. And he'd come and say, oh, pastor, I have been to the move of God. I was called out from the crowd by, you know, the great man of God, the great woman of God, wherever they went, and they prophesied over me. Would you believe it? They prophesied that I was going to be the next Reinhard Bonnke. I am going to be used by God to bring worldwide revival. Some variation of that is what they'd tell me. Hmm. And I said, wow, that's interesting. Thanks for telling me. I said, one day, you know, one day, maybe you will be the next right hard monkey. But right now, you're an idiot. Because you can't get on with people. You're in huge debt. You are a gossip. You've caused me a lot of trouble in this church. And if you would settle down a bit, take responsibility, maybe one day you could be the next Ryan Albonke. But right now, I think you'd be better just knuckling down. Maybe try showing up on time. Maybe check your attitude. And then let's see how we are. I'll see you in six months. There's no love in this church. <laughs> I want my life to be involved with a surprising God, a God who isn't threatened by your ideas and suggestions. Who knew? Who knew that sick people could get healed in a shadow? This was not God's idea. It was desperate people who were crazy, who said, you know what? We're not going to get Peter's attention. Too many people wanting that. What we're going to do is drag our sick bodies and our broken bodies and those of our loved ones, we're going to drag them to that piece of the street. And when Peter comes by, we're going to get touched by his shadow and we're going to get a miracle in his shadow. Even Peter was not involved. His shadow was, but he wasn't. They didn't have a conversation with Peter. Peter, can you just linger there a minute with your shadow? I've got a few more people coming, but they move slow. They're not well. So Peter just, can you walk up and down the street? We don't know that Peter was involved at all. So they got into his shadow and you know what God did? God went, cool, I can do that. You don't need Peter. You want to use Peter's shadow? High five. Let's do that instead. Centurion fact of faith. Who knew that sick people could be healed and demons cast out with a piece of cloth that Paul had prayed over? Who knew? This was not Paul's idea. Desperate people sent these things to him. 
with an idea like the centurion. Hey, they can't get to see you. They can't be here. So they sent this. Would you pray over this and we'll take it back to them and put this on the sick person and we believe we'll get a miracle. And God went, cool, let's do that. Who knew that Jesus could walk on water? <laughs> Who knew that he had a fish ATM? Just go catch a fish. It'll have money in its mouth. Then go pay the taxes. What? I mean, fancy telling that to fishermen. We all want to know where those fish swim, don't we? These things, are not in, these things are not in the Bible for us to reproduce or make a movement out of or over-involve and over-attach to and try to think, oh, that's the new model. These things are in the Bible for one simple reason. They're there to tell you God can do stuff. God can do stuff. And a lot of that stuff is stuff no one ever knew he could do until he did it. And God is desperately wanting to do more stuff like that, but he won't tell you. You've got to get him to speak Chinese. You've got to be audacious. You've got to be willing to appear rude. You know, some of you aren't getting a breakthrough like you need because you're too polite. Because politeness would have waited his turn to get a prayer from Jesus instead of coming down through the roof. Some of you are too polite. I would, I would encourage you this week to experiment with being impolite where your politeness is really abandoning you and your needs to try to appear in a way that you think is acceptable to someone else. If you would stop trying all the time to fit in and be polite and just take your turn, you've got to stop taking your turn and make your turn. And God's going to say, God's going to say, cool, here you are. Where have you been? Let's do that then. High five. Let's do that then. And if you come from a people-pleasing family, and lots of us did, this will be really difficult for you to believe that this is possible and that you should do this because you're afraid of being seen a certain way by people. But I promise you, God, if you like, lives every day to be intercepted, to be interrupted, for us to suggest to him a different way of doing something, a new way of doing something, and God's, gonna not, God's not going to say, hang on, I'm God, I come up with the ideas. <laughs> God's going to say, I like that idea, it's crazy, it's out there, it's rude and impolite, tell you what, let's do that instead. You would be amazed you would be amazed what God would do for you and who God would do it through if you would come out of this idea that God can't use me. I'm not a leader. I'm not a disciple. I'm not in ministry. I'm only newly in the faith. I've messed up a little bit. I don't think I qualify. Mm, you'd be surprised. And I want you going forward from tonight, can I encourage you to experiment with getting God to speak Chinese. I wonder if you, before you go to sleep tonight, could say something to God, could open up to God in a way that God goes, wow, there you are. I'm amazed. What is it that you want to do? And God's not going to judge you or patronize you. He's going to go, boom, high five. Let's do that then. Let's try that then. Let me use you here then. Let me involve in this with you then. If you will step up, you'll be surprised what God would do. And that's what history has been full of, where the church has taken major surges forward. It's because people like this have the audacity to have what I'm trying to describe to you, a centurion factor faith.
It's in this room. It's sat in this room. It's sat in seats that no one's expecting much from. It's in the hearts of people that no one is looking to for anything special to happen. The Bible is full of you, full of people like you, people on your minds and hearts tonight. Let's stand together. You know, when you leave tonight, I'm going to come out and say hi to as many of you that want to say hi. And I have some little cards with resource stuff for me, with me. It's a little QR code thing. And Hannah, out, Hannah works with me. She's out there. And she'll help you know what we have available to you. Um, so let me chat with you out there for a few minutes before you all go, if you'd like. I'd love to say hi to some of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this house that has amazed you over the years, time and again. Thank you for Centurion Fact of Faith that has been in this leadership team in the church. And we stand here tonight and we say to you, we do not want to make you walk down roads that you don't need to because we can't find another level of faith that creates a new option, a new awareness, a new outcome. I pray for courage in all of our hearts to at least step out this week in getting you to speak Chinese, that you would do something for us and through us in our generation at this time and stage of our life that amazes you and creates movement in the earth in a significant way. I pray for health and strength and vitality in the lives of these amazing humans in this room. I pray your blessing and your strengthening and your friendship and your companionship towards the leaders in this house. I pray that you would surprise them in the coming months. I pray that things that they thought would take years will happen in a short time. I pray that you would send things into their world that they anticipated would come some time later but you decided to surprise them and send it now just to let them know you see them, you're for them, and you are not constrained by the time in which you've done things prior to now. Bless this house with love and joy and playfulness and fun and happiness and joy let these things be the characteristics of this house. Let it be spoken of in this whole city and country and world that this house is a house of joy and play and happiness. We just want to have a ball while we're serving you, Lord, because so many of our years have often not been that. Bless every home, every family, every life, every marriage, every parenting in this house tonight and those watching and listening online. In Jesus' amazing, beautiful, matchless, standalone name. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Wow, right? Love you, man. Thank you. Wow, right? You know, I was sitting there and I began to say, God, can you 
free my mind up so I can keep coming up with some good ideas. So many times, so much can be going on that your mind is clogged. And it's almost like you got, you got to freeze. And sometimes you got to pull back from things so you can think again. And I want you to hear me, guys. Heaven is full of ideas. It's full of ideas. All he need is a willing vessel that he can whisper that thing into your spirit. Eyes haven't seen ears haven't heard if you're not afraid to think it and then say it come on turn and look at somebody and say that's a good idea Woo! come on y'all I want to encourage you to think again come on turn and tell someone else whatever it is over your business whatever it is over your ministry whatever it is over your family that is an amazing idea. And I pray that you don't speak it to someone who want to block it. But someone who want to see you do it. So if you don't have any encouragement, can I get it in the house? Can you turn and tell at least three people, that is an amazing idea. That is an, that is an amazing idea. You going to see it? You going to live it? You're going to touch it. If you believe that, put a praise behind your idea. That's an amazing idea. You know how we have the passport fair? One of our members came in and said, Pastor Anna, you've been telling us to get our passports. And I retired from there. What if we had a passport fair? I was like, that's an amazing idea. Sometimes we have the ability of shooting it down in our mind without speaking it out of our mouths. So with that, we cancel the spirit of fear. That you not be afraid to think again. And once you think, speak it again. Come on, lift your hands and worship God for 10 seconds for that. And I pray that God begin to clear your mind. That you can think again. That you can move again. I pray that you be like Peter. Can I step out the boat? Can I walk on water too? Come on, I want you to have that. I want you to take the limits off God. If you take the limits off God, you take the limits off yourself. Five more seconds. Worship God. Let me think again. Let me think again. Let me think again. Come on, if you're online, I speak to you. Wherever you are, you're such a creative person. And I speak to your creativity. And I cancel the negative words that you've heard to stop you from being creative. And now we breathe life back into your creativity that you can think again. You have so many testimonies. You've already stepped out the boat. You might as well walk. Give God a praise for what's about to come on you. Hallelujah. Can y'all do me a favor? Can we celebrate Paul one more time? Can you just... So he has a table in the lobby. Now y'all know where I follow him. If you don't follow him on social media, can we put his name back on? My... Take your phones out. Go to your Instagram. Let's pull him up right now on Instagram. The nuggets that he will give you will change your life. The nuggets that he will give you. Which... Those of y'all that are watching online, I need you to follow him inbox him to speak life tell him wow I get it there you go there you go you can stop in the lobby you can greet him talk to him he's on the south side of Chicago 
He in the hood. I told y'all, the Lord told me, when you build it, I'll send people from all over the world to come to what they call the dead zone. That's what they call this community, a dead zone. But he says, but when you come, you bring life. I want us to get a seat in our hand. You can get a seat in your hand. Those of you that are online in the building, can you give a $20 seat or 10? However you feel led. A 20 or 10. If you need an envelope, you can raise your hand. If you need the QR code to give, you can give. If you want to text and give, text verse NLCSC to 91694. Come on, we're moving quickly. Those on the online, when you hear this, whenever you hear this, you can sow into this. But I want you to sow into your own idea. Isn't that amazing? So into your own idea. Some of y'all, there's a business in you. There's a fresh start for you. So into it. I never saw it like that. Help me to think again. Stretch my imagination. Stretch my imagination. If you don't have the 20, you don't have the 10, you can get the best seed that you can in your hand. Come on, you can sow it. You ready? Come on, lift your seed up to the Lord. Repeat after me. I'm a tithe and a giver. And I am blessed beyond measure. I have more than enough. I'm living in my overflow. Come on, say this. I am living in Ephesians 3.20. How long are you going to live it? For the rest of my life. Do me a favor, New Life. Before you leave, I want us to pray over two pastors. I meet with um, a group of pastors once a month, and we call it the Pastor Circle. And they're from all over. And we have one from California and one from around the corner. St. Louis, right? St. Louis. Can you guys step up? We just want to pray for you. Stretch your hands this way so God we cover these pastors, these leaders. We ask God.